This is Ham College, episode 54 for June 30th, 2019. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. Make the most out of this contest season with ICOM and by hamstudy.org, a great way to study for your next license exam. Welcome to another exciting episode of Ham College Class. I'm Professor Thomas. And I'm Dean Martin. And it's great to be back uh, tonight. And boy, we had a little chat room snafu at the beginning there. Yeah, we did. I hope it's all cleared up now. I think it's all cleared up now. Uh, You know, speaking of chat room, if you're watching live, you should go to the chat room. If you can do that at the same time, amateurlogic.tv slash chat. And check out what's going on in there. We ask the questions here, and you guys answer in there. And then we look at your answers. Compared to ours. Compared to ours. And then we see what the correct answer is. Yep, that's a lot of fun. Yep. And in between all of that, we got some splaining to do. We do, a little bit. We got some gazentas to do tonight. We do. You got your gazenta later over there? I do. It's already all queued up and ready to go. Uh, yeah, I think you're right. It is. That's it right that's there. That's it. Okay. Well, that's good to know because we're probably going to need to pull that out here in a little bit. No doubt. Well, you know, field day was just this past weekend. Not tonight, but this past weekend. Yep. Yeah, it was a good time. It was really hot, but nevertheless, yeah. it was fun. It was fun, and it was good. Although it's a lot of work, it was good to be able to return to the woods to do field day after uh, after a long hiatus. This is the first time in three years. Yeah. And I brought I brought souvenirs back with me. I brought chiggers. You got the, the chigger bites, yeah? Yeah. Uh, somehow I missed those, <clears throat> although I did find a tick crawling on my leg the first night. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I found it and never had another one. So I guess the way I handled that first one must have scared the rest <laughs> off. <us. laughs> I don't know. but uh, You must have done him pretty bad. Yep. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun field day, though. And I, for field day, and I suspect most of you know in the chat room, but there might be some in there that are not hams, we... Ham radio operators, when I say we, once a year have, it's not really a contest, although you could say it is. It's an event to where you take all your gear, you go set it up somewhere, and you get on the air and you make contacts and see how many you can make. And you get extra points if you're doing things like operating on a generator or out in the public promoting amateur radio. There's a number of different qualifications Mm -hmm. to get extra points. And we do that. Every year, some years, the past two, we weren't able to do that because, well, the weather here just prevented us, and I see it did this year, prevented a few folks from doing it. We were lucky enough that we were able to to get back outdoors and do it again. Yeah. Although that's not a requirement. We've done it here from the studios for the past couple of years. Yeah, we usually... We we never really do things in moderation too well, so we went pretty much way off the grid. Everything again. except points. Every, we tried to keep them in moderation. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that part up. Well, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know, we're we're more out just to socialize and have a good time and practice our uh, camping and woodsman skills than we are to win win a contest. Yeah. You know, it, it's all about fun. Yeah, and, and test, testing the gear out. I like to get my yep. stuff out of there, out and use it and set it up, you know, just make sure everything works. If the emergency comes, I know where 
all my things are, mm -hmm. that it all works well together and, and exactly what I would need to do. Yeah, and we learn a little something every year. I know le this year we learned a couple of valuable lessons. We're not going to go into them tonight. We'll be covering them on the next Amateur Logic, which will be in about two weeks. We'll have the wrap-up of all our field day coverage right there, and you should, should join us then. Oh, yeah, this should be a fun show. But tonight, we got to get back to studying for that general exam uh, because, well, the question pool is about to expire so we've had a in a few days. Yeah, we're, we're going to cover all the changes, though. But uh, tonight, we've got some more out of the current question pool to go through. And it's a variety of different kind of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, some some of them are a little difficult. Uh, some of them maybe not. Yeah, I I think uh, I think everyone's going to have a pretty good chance on these tonight. Just saying, not yeah. that that means anything. But just we'll see. That that's my feeling on the matter. Well, let's get on into the first one here. I'll let you ask me this one. <laughs> okay. What is meant by the term ROM? A. Resistor operated memory. B. Read only memory. C. Random operational memory. Or D. Resistant to overload memory. I bet everyone in the chat room gets this one right, right here. And probably most folks who eventually watch the program will probably get this one right. I've never heard of resistance to overload memory. But I, I feel it. I've sometimes. never heard of random operational memory. I've never heard of resistor-operated memory. Never. But I have heard a lot about read-only memory. And that's what it stands for, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say? Oh, yeah. And that's what everybody's saying over in the chat room. It's B, read-only memory. So that was easy enough, and I appreciate you giving me a simple one there to get started Well, you think you took that one. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, but, you know, <laughs> I wanted to give you credit. What is meant when memory is characterized as non-volatile? A, it's resistant to radiation damage. B, it is resistant to high temperature. C, the stored information is maintained even if power is removed. Or D, the stored information cannot be changed once written. Okay, so cannot be, it's not going to be D. Non non volatile means that it's that it's stable. It's not volatile. It means yeah. Uh, so stored information cannot be changed once written. That's that's not going to be it. It's, uh, stored information is maintained even if the power is removed. That's pr that's probably the one, but let's look at the others. It's resistant to high temperature? Uh, I don't think that's it either. And resistant to radiation damage? That's not it either. I don't know why we would really need that. So it's going to be C. The stored information is maintained even if the power is removed. I'll agree with you. Everybody in the chat room is agreeing with you. Even if you get radiated. Bam. Oh, yeah. Just I like to give that. You yours. Yeah. You owe me one then. Here. <laughs> okay. I'll take it in advance. Oh, that was for the last no, one. No, that was for the last one. Okay. Yeah, I was in arrears on that one. So. Yeah. Now I'm caught up. All right. Well, have you got a question for me? I do have one. Which of the following is an advantage of CMOS integrated circuits compared to TTL integrated circuits? A, low power consumption. B, high power handling capacity. C, better suited for RF amplification. Or D, better suited for power supply regulation. Hmm. I need to read that one again. Which of the following is an advantage of CMOS, CMOS, Integrated circuits compared to TTL integrated circuits. And I'll start at the bottom. Better suited for power supply regulation? No. I don't think that's it. Better suited for RF amplification? No. Higher power handling capacity? I don't think that's it either. 
I think the main reason that we got uh, CMOS technology is because of A, low power consumption. What do you say? Yeah, I agree. They definitely used less power. Everyone in the chat room agrees. Low power consumption. We got a bunch of Einsteins in here tonight. We do. You can't fool those guys. Now when it comes to... Or, and girls, if there's some in there. Yeah. Now when it comes to computer stuff, especially. Yep. Most especially. All right. Well, we got one more computer question here. Have you got uh -oh. your bit twiddler handy? Because we're going to need it on this one. Uh-oh. How many states does a 3-bit binary counter have? Let me say that again. And I've got a magic button for you right here if you, yeah. if you want it. So, well, it's not 100% magic. It's only about 50% effect. Yeah. How many states does a 3-bit binary counter have? Is it A, 3? B, 6? C, Eight or D sixteen. Okay, so that's going to be all right. Well, let's let's get you do some splaining here on this one. I am going to do some splaining. You do need to see the answer. The, put me on the spot. <laughs> well, well, I know I can. I know how to figure the answer. Uh, so binary is a one or a zero, and if there's three, three, it said three bits, right? Right. So there's three bits. It can be a one or, or a zero or a zero one. Uh, the combination of these is what it's referring to. All right. So, so show us all our okay, combinations. Okay. So to get that, to get that, we can do some simple math. That's going to be two because there's a one and a zero. There are two options times three. So that's going to be one cubed. To get the or two cubed, so that's going to be two times two is four, and two times four is going to be eight. So it's going to be eight, eight uh, combinations. So there's eight different combinations you're saying. I believe that's right. Well, let's see. Well, I know we can. That's one combination. That's one. Let's see, we could also do that. Uh, we could do that we could do that it's one two three four five i only count five combinations which one am i missing um oh i see you another yeah, one you got to go the other way um Yep. I didn't do these, so I did them in a different order. Two, three. I would have done well, that, but that, that, that. Yeah. Oh, you got that there, so then I would yeah. have started out to, to do them in order, but it went that, zero, one, one, zero, no, one. I already got one, one, one. It's going to be eight, just because I know the math is going to work well, for that. Yeah, well, I just wanted them to see how they could figure it out for themselves. But what if you had a five-bit counter? You're going to have to take a lot of paper. It's going to take more paper. But, okay, so you got this number right here. Well, let's just see if it's eight. I, I'm pretty sure that's right. It's, it's kind of got to be. I'm pretty sure that you're sure that's right, and it is. And, um... There were a lot of numbers in the calc in the uh, chat room over here. I was going to say the calculator room, um, but yeah. So, if I saw this number here, zero one zero, what does that what does that really equal? Um, that would be zero one two five. Um, zero one zero. Oh, zero, one, zero? Yeah. Well, one, two. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the way you do it. Starting on the right-hand side, the first digit here is, if that's all zeros and everything's zeros, well, it's a, it's a zero. But 
if all you've got is an 001, what is that number going to be? One. That's going to be one. So if all you've got is an 010, what's it going to be? If it's the second place, it's got a one. Ten. Two. One. Oh, that's two, where it goes. That's right. Four. Yeah. So it just doubles <clears throat> that's as, right. it, as it goes across there. Anyway. Maybe we should move on. Yeah, maybe we should. It's been a while since I looked at that stuff. Like it, it, I, yeah, I had to look at it recently, so it was kind of kind of on my mind there. It's not something you normally do. Well, in programming, it used to be. Well, back hell, when we used to do those I.O. cards, but it's been like 25 years since I looked at that stuff. Well, see, I still do them, so I had to, <clears throat> I had to do it um, not too long ago, actually, for something. I tell you what, based on that, we're going to switch gears. Yeah, because I need a drink of water. Because we need to talk about truth tables. Uh-oh. So if you will get... Let the truth be told. Yeah, if you'll get the <laughs> Geiger counter out... No, wait a minute. That's not the right thing. <laughs> the, uh, the lie detector out. The polygraph. We'll come back in just a minute, and uh, we got some truth tables to talk about. Okay. Heard it, worked it, logged it. It's time to get the transceiver that's best suited for your lifestyle. ICOM offers a variety of high-performance and innovative products. Make the most out of contest season with one of these ICOMs today. IC7610, the SDR every ham wants. This high-performance SDR has the ability to pick out the faintest of signals, even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling, software-defined radio that will change the world's definition of a SDR transceiver. RF direct sampling, 110 RMDR, independent dual receivers, and dual digicell. Or get the IC7300. Changing the way entry-level HF is designed, this high-performance, innovative HF transceiver with a compact design will far exceed your expectations. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real-time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Find out more by visiting icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Thanks ICOM for sponsoring Ham College. You know, every month on Ham College, we have a Special swag prize giveaway here. A nice icon cap. That is a nice cap. It is. I've got one just like it. And a nice icon ham crew t shirt. And I've got one just like this too. I, I love it. I wear it a lot. Good heavy duty t shirt. And how could I get one of those? You, well, you've got to have, there's a prerequisite. You got two things you've got to have. Okay. First thing you got to have is a name. No, got most of us. We <laughs> ran across some people earlier yeah, today. Some people that... don't have names. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, you got to have a name and an email address. And all you got to do is send that information into ham college at amateurlogic.tv to get into the drawing. The drawing is only good for the current month. So if you don't win the t shirt and hat, and if and you want to win, enter for next month, you're going to need to send it in again. We do not keep your email address, right? Any of that information, it goes nowhere. Step into the bit bucket after we get finished with yep. the current month. So, anyway, very nice shirts and a and a very nice cap. And okay. Like, like George says, Jesse usually puts some extra goodies in the bag as well when he sends them out. So no telling what else you you'll get is when your stuff comes. And. I just happened to draw a random number before the show tonight. Just so happened to. Just so happened to. And well, selected. Was convenient. It was. And I selected a lucky winner from the pool of contestants. Excellent. And, well, here. Are you going to keep us in suspense? No, I'll let you read it. Well, you could have printed it a little smaller. <laughs> That's why I'm letting you read it. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> please enter my name in the drawing for the ICOM t-shirt and cap. I do have a name and an email address. So he's qualified infinitely. He, do, he does. That's all you got to have. And uh, 
T-E-R-J-E. -E. I'm, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that, but Terz or Terze or I, I don't know. We're we're probably wrong because probably probably so. But congratulations on your uh, winning the cap and the T-shirt and whatever else Jesse then put into the package. You'll be hearing from ICOM uh, pretty quickly about that. They're they're really fast about getting those things out. So uh, yeah. thanks for thanks for entering. You better hang on to that. Yep. And uh, so you guys, any of you that didn't win, if you entered, uh, re-enter again after the show, and you already cleared the queue out, right? Yes, I have raised all the names okay, that were in so, there. So go ahead and send your entry in for next month, and uh, maybe you'll get a chance to win, or you, you will have a chance to win, rather. Yep. And where do they send it? Ham College at Am <laughs> that place right there. Ham College at AmateurLogic.tv. Okay. Looks You're like trying the, to trick me, aren't you? <laughs> now I got ahead of myself. <laughs> I hit the button too quick. We're going to shift gears and talk about something a little different now, and and that was the truth tables. And we don't have a polygraph here, so you're just going to kind of have to take our word. Use this table. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, this table will work as good as any. This is logic gates. D various types of logic gates. Light water gate. Yeah. There are more types than this, but these are the most common right here that you're likely to run up against. And we're just going to talk about them real quick. Each of these symbols represents a different type of logic. And we were just talking about ones and zeros a minute ago. This is Boolean logic mm -hmm. is, is what you would call this. So we've got a, here's the way it's laid out. We've got a name. We've got a picture of the device. I'm just labeling the inputs and outputs on the first couple, but it's the same on all of them. And then here is the truth table. So this first one is called a buffer, and it's got one input on it, input A there, and it's got an output. So it's just going to buffer. Whatever you put in, you're going to get the same thing on the output. So if we look over here on the input, there's only one input, it's A. If, the, if we got a zero on the A, we got a zero on the output. If we've got a one on the input, we got a one on an output. Yeah. That makes sense. Looks more well, like a pipeline. And if you program uh, computers, all this is pretty much the same thing. Over here next to it, we've got one that you could call a not gate, but it's commonly called an inverter. Looks like the same symbol, but it's got a little circle there on the output. There again only one input and of course the output so explain this one to us Dean well it's just inverting it mm -hmm. so if it's a zero or if it's a low it's going to be a high or a false it's going to be a true and if, likewise if it's high it's going to be low yep On the so output. it's it just inverts whatever you put in you get the opposite out if we look on down here a little further to the left, we've got an AND gate. It's got uh, two inputs on it. It's got an A input and a B input and an output. And you can see the symbol is, is rounded off on the output side of it there. The truth table shows it's AND. You've got to have A and B to get an output. So if both of them are zero, you got a zero out. If a is zero and B is a one, you got a zero out. If A is one and B is zero, you got a zero out. The only thing that's going to give you a one out here or a true or a high, whatever you want to call it, is going to be a combination where you've got a, a one or a high on both the inputs at the same time. Then you get a high on the output. Mm -hmm. So it's end. You got to have both both of those conditions have to be met. The OR gate, you can have either one of these here, is can be high and you got a high on the output. If they're both low inputs, you got a low out or zero out. If the inputs, uh, if either one of them has a one or a high, you got a one out. If both of them are high, you got a one out. So yeah, it's yeah. either OR. So, if, so, so that's a right, the or, opposite. If A or B, Yep. That's true. If A, yeah, if A or B, so. Yep. Uh, explain this one over here. 
Well, it's going to be the opposite. And what's the name of that? That's a nor or a not or game. Yep. And so if it's a zero in or on A, or zero on both of the inputs, you're going to get a one on the output, which is exactly opposite. If you've got a zero and a one, you're going to get a zero. A one and a zero, you're going to get a zero. Or a one and a one, you're going to get a zero. So actually, so it's, it's literally it's literally opposite of the other one. Of the OR gate. Yes. Then you've got an XOR. That's uh, exclusive OR. Do you want to explain that or do you want me to explain you it? You can go for that one. Okay. So over here in the regular OR gate, you saw that you can have either one of them can be a 1, or they can both be a 1. On an exclusive OR gate, you've got to have either one or the other, but not both. It's got to be exclusively only one of the inputs is high to get a high out. So right there you can see if they're both high, you got a 0 out, unlike the case over here on the OR gate where you'd have a 1. Then you've got a NAND gate. What do you think a NAND well, I'm in the theme of the others, that's going to be not an AND gate. Mm -hmm. So it probably should have been opposite of the other one up there. But well, it probably should have been, shouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so but, it's going to be right to whatever this one is. You just invert whatever's coming out of it, huh? Yes. And then we've got an XNOR. <laughs> or an XNAY. Or, or whatever you want. He's speaking Pig Latin. Yeah, I don't know what he's saying. Exclusive NOR gate. So it's just like the, the gate, the NOR gate you were talking about up here, except it can only be one of these has got to be high. If both of them are high, it's, um, it's not going to give you the zero out. That's interesting. Trying to think of what you would use something like that for. There are cases, not, not that you're going to run across in everyday life, but... Uh, there are cases where, where these things would be handy. Uh, of course, on logic gates, yeah, they're handy in everyday life. Uh, you've, got, you've got a bunch of them in that computer over there. There's, there's even some in my mouse here, I'm sure. Yeah. I hadn't counted. I hadn't opened it up to look. But Well, you want um, to? Well, not right now. <laughs> so... I see they're already guessing letters over here in the chat room. I guess we should get on into the questions. I guess so. Some of them are already answering them. The question's not even up yet. Well, that's what I'm talking about. They're trying to get ahead, and which is not a bad idea, but somebody's going to have the wrong answer. I, I just feel like it. That's the right answer. We just got to find the question it belongs to. That's a good point. <laughs> that's why you're a dean. Well, let's see if this is the right question. Which of the following describes the function of a two-input AND gate? A. Output is high when either or both inputs are low. B. Output is high only when both inputs are high. C. Output is low when either or both inputs are high. Or D. Output is low only when both inputs are high. Is this mine? Yep. I guess it is since you started reading it. Well, I guess so, because I wasn't okay. sure. So this is an AND gate. So that means both of them have to be high for it to be high. Output is high when either or both inputs are high. No. B, output is high only when both inputs are high. That I think that's going to be the one. Uh, let's see. Output is low. C. Output is low when either both, either or both are high. Either or both. No. Output is low when both inputs. No. It's going to be B. Bravo. Output is high only when both inputs are high. Well, let's check our nearby truth table there. And if we look at the AND gate, yeah, both inputs have to be high to get a high output. Imagine that. We just go figure. It is B, and everybody said it was B in the chat room, except those guys who guessed in advance, and they were wrong. I don't think anybody. But they'll said. be right soon. Yeah. It'll, pretty soon it'll be A. Don't worry. Okay. Well, let's see if it'll be this time around. Which of the following describes the function 
of a two input NOR gate or not OR gate? A. Output is high when either or both inputs are low. B. Output is high only when both inputs are high. C. Output is low when either or both inputs are high. Or D. Output is low only when both inputs are high. Which of the following describes the function of a two input NOR gate? That means not OR. All right. So that's, I'm thinking, in that case, if either input is high, I'm going to get a low out. So let's, let me look here. There's two choices that give me a low there. Let's see. C, output is low when either or both inputs are high. I'm going to say that's it. It's going to be C. Because if either one of them's high, I'm going to get a low output. Uh, checking a nearby truth table, the NOR gate, if either one of those is high, I've got a low out. See, I'm going to say it's C. The whole chat room says it's C. There you go. Mm. Or maybe that should be a not fist pump. <laughs> Complex digital circuitry can often be replaced by what type of integrated circuit? A, a microcontroller. C, charge couple device. C, a phase detector. Or D, window comparator. Uh, I'm not sure what a window comparator is, but I don't think that's it. If, I don't think it's phase detector or a charge couple device, which is a CCD. I'm sure it's not that or the phase detector. It's going to be a microcontroller. Complex digital circuitry can be replaced by a, a microcontroller. That's what they're all saying over in the chat room, except... Ralph, who said it was PDQ Bach. I'm not sure. He's probably right. Yeah. But it is a microcontroller. What is a microcontroller? Well, it's like a little Arduino. It's yeah. basically a, a little chip that you can program to do a lot of different functions, uh, whatever you want. Well, so, or you could program it, or some may be pre-programmed. Yeah. So it's complex digital circuitry in there that can be... That can replace all those gates we were looking at. Right. And you could just program it to do the same thing that all those would. Yeah. That's the beauty of the Arduino. Boy, isn't stuff. it, man. I, that's that's why I like them so much. Yeah. As I used to say, programming is like uh, building something, but you don't have to run up to Radio Shack to buy the parts. Yeah. It's fun fun stuff. I'm, I'm finally starting to get back into some of that at work. So I'll be yeah. looking forward to that. I know you're going to have fun with it. Because after you've been out a while, it's good to mm. do oh, a little yeah. programming again. I'm not sure why we're looking at this, but I got a feeling. Well, I need to burn it to memory. Yeah, we are going to be needing this. I have the worst this. time remembering these things. I don't use them very often, so I just don't really have a need to commit them to memory. There's other more important things using up those memory cells in there. Except in the next few minutes. <clears throat> Except in the next few minutes. What we might call this is um, an Ohm's Law circle, table, chart, whatever you want to call it. This is various formulas related to Ohm's Law and to power. And we're going to need some of these coming up. The, basically, the way it works, we can't see the bottom of it, but let's just look at one here. What this would be is voltage equals... Resistance times current, I is current, R is resistance, or voltage equals power over current, or voltage equals the square root, <laughs> if I can reach it, of uh, power times resistance. And it works the same way over here. If you want to know power, here's the various formulas that you can use to determine power and current the various ones down there for current or for resistance. 
So that's essentially how that works. You need to know some of these for your test. It would be nice if you knew all those formulas. We're not counting on everybody knowing all of them. Good. And we may need more than one in some of these questions. Uh, probably so. Probably so. You've got Just the calculator? Yep, it's up there. Okay, we're going to need that. How many watts of electrical power are used if 400 volts DC is supplied to an 800 ohm load? Is it A, 0.5 watts? B, 200 watts? C, 400 watts? Or D, 3,200 watts? Yeah, how many? All right. Okay, wait, that's, I'm supposed to answer this, I think. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And so tell them how you're going to figure it out. Okay. I think I'm, uh, I'm going to need to divide 400 by 800. Okay, let's see. How many watts of electrical power are you to get the to get the current? And then I think So you're saying the correct formula would be what? Where's the chart? <laughs> you don't get to see the chart when you take your exam. No. Yeah, aren't you solving for power? Yeah, so it's going to be P equals. Okay, P equals R divided. No. P divided by. P equals I divided by R. Oh, there's the one you need right there. P equals E squared divided by R. Okay. Wouldn't you say? Wouldn't I give it to you? E squared? I guess that would be the same result. But I think you could get to it the other way as well. Uh, how was the other way? By uh, getting the um, the resistant, no, the, the current, which would be... Well, you could, yeah. And 0.5... Amps, and then multiply that times the voltage, which would give you 200 watts. All right. So I think you that's wanna, right. Well, you want to try it and see if it works. We'll do it, Archie. Just you got, did it. You got 400 volts Four. and 800 ohms. And that's 0.5 what? Amps. Amps, okay. And then uh -huh. to get the watts, I'm pretty sure you multiply that times the voltage. Well, let's see. And the voltage was 400, I think, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. All right, uh, so so you you believe it's... Uh, I think it's... It's going to be 200. Yeah, that's what I think. I'm probably wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's right. All right, well, that would be a B then. Yeah. So do we need to do it the other way? Um, I think we should since it's, it's, it's the shortest cut to do it. It's 400 volts. Well, that's going to be times 400. No. Yeah. A squared. 400 times 400. All right. And divided then, by 800. Yep. Divided by the resistance. So the same result. So you could get that one Either the same way. way. Okay. 200 watts. So there's two different ways to solve that one. That's good to know. Yeah. You can use two formulas to do it, or you can use one. Same result. Yeah, same result. Yeah. If you only know those two, though, <laughs> that's the way you need yeah, to do it. Yeah, that's pretty much yeah. the end of that's pretty much the end of mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got some more here, so why don't you ask me one? There's a chance you could stop me here. Okay. Because I don't do this every day. Ooh, I'm glad you got this one. Well, the chat room, uh, they were mixed a little bit on that. Yeah. 
I can see why. Yeah, they were mixed. This is on pretty that. tough stuff to remember. Yeah. If you got if you got the thing, you sit down and you can look look at it and really think about it with mm -hmm. the formula. So it's not that bad. But just remembering off the top of your head, if you don't use it, it's pretty tough. Yeah. What would what would the RMS voltage across a 50 ohm dummy load dissipating 1200 watts, or what would be the RMS voltage across a 50 ohm dummy load dissipating 1200 watts? A 173 volts. B, 245 volts. C, 346 volts. Or D, 692 volts. Okay, I'm solving for voltage, and I know resistance and power. So, there's probably more than one way to solve this. And I will try the hardest one first. Yeah, because I don't even have a clue where to start on this one, to be totally honest with you. All right. Well, I'm so just... let's look at this wheel and see what the formula is. Well, do we want to do that, or do we just want to guess at it? Uh, it doesn't matter. I guess guess at it, and then we can show it. But I think we should show which one's the right one at some point. Oh, well, we, yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Um, yeah, that's probably a good idea. I'll pull up the wheel, though. What, I'm, what I need is to know voltage, and I know resistance and wattage. So, voltage, and I know resistance, oh, but I don't there's know. No there's no one formula to solve that with. Wait a minute. There actually is. It's voltage equals the square root of power times resistance. So we'll take our 1200 watts, multiply it by 50 ohms, that gives us 60,000. Take the square root of that, and it's 245B. Uh, of the people that guessed in the chat room, oh, there were some A's in there too. A little tricky. I see two B's. I see, do see a couple of B's, and then I see a couple of A's. So, um, yeah, this is a little tougher. I eked by on that one. Let's see how you'll do on this one. Uh, probably not as good. How many watts of electrical power are used by a 12-volt DC bulb that draws 0.2 amperes? This is a simple one. Okay, 12. Uh, is it A, 2.4 watts? Oh, B, B, 24 watts. C, 6 watts. Or D, 60 watts. And so, what formula would you use? So to get uh, how many watts? So we've got 12 volts, we've got power, and we've got I. Now we got volts and current. Um, this is a pretty simple formula if you know it. Yeah, but I'm not sure I know it. If you had a nearby chart, chart, maybe hanging on the wall or maybe, something, maybe. Yeah, you might be able to figure this out. <laughs> it's pretty. It's a. It's a easily remembered formula once you know that you'll you'll need to remember it. I usually say it the backwards of the way my particular chart happens to have it here. Okay. So, okay. So, to multi multiply the uh, volts and the amps. I think. All right. So, you're saying it is uh, P equals I times E. Plus 12 volts. Or E times I. Either times way. And 0.2 amps. 2.4. 2.4, so you... Watts. That'll be A. All right, well, let's see. 2.4. 2.4. Okay. That's, that's that good. That was fun. That was fun. So that's an easy formula to remember. P equals I times E. P-I-E. Pi. Pi. Yep. Hit me with the hard one here. 
Gladly. <laughs> <laughs> How many watts are dissipated when a current of 7 milliamperes flows through 1.25 kiloohms resistance? A, approximately 61 milliwatts. B, approximately 61 watts. C, approximately 11 milliwatts. D, approximately 11 watts. So this makes me think the, there is some trick think, answers in there. Some, there's some trickery going on here for sure. All right, so I'm trying to find power. I'm solving for power, and I know current and resistance. I believe the formula is P equal I squared R. Have to get rid of those fractions, aren't we? Yep, 0 0.007, which is 7 milliamps. And square that, so times 0 0.007. Oh, I could have probably done that. All right, and what... What do you get there? That's a little number. All right, now say that times the resistance, which was 1250. And let's see, we, that's going to be in. It's going to give you watts. In millis, milliwatts, so it's. That would be 61 milliwatts. 61 milliwatts. Let's see if that was one of the possible choices. Yeah, I'm going to say it's A. And what the chat room is, they're saying it's A. A. There you go. A. A. I got it. All right. And I got a headache. <laughs> well, and it's just in time, too. Because, you know, I have just the thing right here for a headache. You got a ball ping hammer? Now this, this was not planned either, man. This just kind of worked out. But we're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. we got a few more questions to go. But, boy, after that, I think... Uh, I thought you said it was going to be pretty easy tonight. Well, we hadn't missed one yet. Must well, have been we were that close, though. Well... Here, let's let's take care of that headache first. Okay. Open up Budweiser and pour yourself the most inviting glass of beer you've ever tasted. Sure. Cold, golden Budweiser with that good taste for good times. So go ahead, live life, every golden minute of it. Enjoy Budweiser, every golden drop of it. Budweiser beer is for folks who know where there's life. Are you new to the ham world or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level? Study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. HamStudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbean, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org, powered by ICOM, for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. How does your headache feel now? Well, that Bud Light, once I finally found the little church key thing to open the can up, it's much better now. Yeah, I don't know that I've ever drank 
one that you had to open with a can opener. Oh no, those, those are long gone by the time mm -hmm. I was of drinking mm -hmm. age. Which of these connector types is commonly used for RF connections at frequencies up to 150 megahertz? Is it A, octal? B, RJ11? C, PL259? Or D, DB25? Okay. I don't know what octal connection is. But an RJ11... I believe that's like an old telephone jack. An old telephone jack, you mean? Like, oh. Like, uh, like that right there? Just exactly like that. That happens to be an RJ11 right there. That's well, an that RJ, happens this to be is an RJ45. RJ Let's see, do they look, ah, one's bigger than the other. I've never seen RF up to 150 megahertz travel through one of those. No. So I don't probably doesn't seem like a good idea. So no. let's put those back out of the way. I don't have a DB25, but I think we've well, got we a got DB37, which should be the same with more like, pins. Yeah, it's like that, except it's just a little shorter. I don't. But that doesn't seem like a good RF connection either. No, I don't recall seeing one of those hooked to an antenna. Okay, and um, the other, other and one octal? was uh, yeah. An octal would be like the base of an old tube. It's circular and it's got pins on it. Okay. I don't recall seeing well, that. Well, I do see something here on the table that looks ideal for the occasion. And that would be my my lovely PL259 here. Also that is a PL259. known as a UHF connector in some circles. Yep. I think when it was invented, UHF was <laughs> a lower frequency, seriously. But that right. would be it. So you're saying it is, uh, you're saying it's C. Uh, that's what, exactly what I'm saying. Well, yeah, that's what they're saying over in the chat room. PL259. Right. You can't fool me on the PL259s. That, I got that, that. That was a foolhardy thing to try. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a few more RF connectors here. Let's just look at them before we move on. Okay. This is a popular one. This is a, uh, a BNC connector. It's a bayonet type. I have you know, crimped on many of those. Me too. This one right here, I think, came from Radio Shack at a store buyout because I've never seen one like this before, and I don't think I would use it. It's got a set screw in the side. You just strip back your coax. And you poke it up in there, and then you tighten that screw down on it. I can't imagine. Don't seem like a it good would be idea. very good, but uh, that that is a B and C connector, and this is a really oddball that it's like that. But yeah, I like the crimp on ones. Yeah. Now there's another connector that looks similar to that. Look at this. Yeah, that's a weird same one right size, there. except that's that's got threads in there. That almost looks sort of like a well, it's it's threaded like a PL259 is, but the inside looks like a B and C. Yeah. What do you call that? Well, because just because somebody told me earlier yeah, well, that works. it's a mini UHF. No, it's not. <laughs> that is no, a... Oh, no, that's the uh, TNC. TNC. Connector. It's like a threaded B and C connector. Yeah. Boy, I let the cat out of the bag on the next round, though. Well, I think yeah, you might have. What would is this? Uh, would you call this a mini UHF? No, that's not a mini UHF. What would you call but it? But it is good for UHF frequencies. It is. It's great for UHF frequencies. That's a Type N connector. Type N. Yep, you're right about that. This one you'll see around the house a lot. I don't have the wire sticking out the end. But this is a pretty popular one for uh, oh, television yeah. antennas. Yeah, cable television. Yep, or um, any 75-ohm uh, video applications that might have this type on it. Uh, that's a F connector. Fairly cheap. And so you, you see them a lot. Is that what the F stands for? I'm not sure. Fairly cheap? Could be. This one right here... This is a real oddball. It looks sort of like um, 
Sort of like the yeah. TNC. Yeah, that's why I got it mixed up. Except it doesn't have <clears> those little, uh, you know, pressure fitted uh, ground on the inside there. It's just a pin on the inside. This is a real oddball. And I, I have never seen one being used before. This obviously also came in a Radio Shack store closeout. And wow, what in the world would you call that? Would well, you say I that this was? Already left the cat out of the bag on that. Well, one. you kind of have. That is a mini UHF connector. Once you let the cat out of the bag, you can't get him back in there. No, it's, <laughs> he won't go back <laughs> unless he climbs in by himself. You That's can't coax him in though. Yep. So yep, mini UHF. A mini connector. UHF. I've never seen one used, but if I had an occasion, I've got at least you're, one of them. You're ready. Yep. This one, this end right here, that's a little bitty, and they're usually, uh, a lot of them are gold-plated, like this one appears to be. What do you call that? That's an SMA. That's an SMA. That, uh, that fits on your SDR play or a lot of... Uh, a lot of your newer handy talkies. Newer handy talkies, yep. A lot of uh, lower power or real high frequency stuff sma yeah and that little coax right there is actually pretty good stuff you wouldn't think it would be as little as it is yeah but uh yeah considering... i wouldn't use i wouldn't use a long piece but for short short stuff like this yeah it's not bad and of course that on the other end is so239 that's what fits the uh the pl259 so there's some common RF connectors that I had laying around the shack. There's more than that. These are the ones you're going to run across I've most of the time. I've never put one of these on before. The uh, Type-In? Yeah. They are fun. That's I what have. I hear. Yeah. That's why I avoid them. It's got to be just right, too, because if you get that pin too long sticking out the center there, you'll tear up the connector you plug it into. Mm. I've had a lot of antennas at work that suffered from that. Questions. You got questions? We got questions. Well, I thought you were going to say we got answers. So we're no, not the radio show. They're not thing. around. They don't answer questions. No more anymore. answers. They quit answering questions a or, long time ago. Or the phone. Went. They don't answer the phone anymore either. That's true. Which of the following describes a type N connector? A, a moisture resistant RF connector useful to 10 gigahertz. B, a small bayonet connector used for data circuits. C, a threaded connector used for hydraulic systems. Or D, an audio connector used in surround sound installations. Uh, well, type N connector, we just showed it. Yep, that would be the type N connector. I think the answer to that one is going to be A. A moisture resistant RF connection connector useful to 10 gigahertz. That seems awful high, but. Yeah, it does seem high, but must be correct. And yeah, there is a rubber gasket in there, and when you screw this thing on, it's uh, pretty much moisture resistant. Yeah, they're much, they're much better connectors than the PL259s, but. Uh, yeah. But yeah. they said moisture resistant, they didn't say waterproof. If you've got an antenna outdoor that takes one of these, go ahead and seal it up good with some yeah. uh, tape or coaxial or whatever you use, because you're you're going to want that. So I'm going with A. Going with A. Well, everybody in the chat room is going with A. I haven't seen any of these we use in a hydraulic system. I yeah. haven't either. Oh. Well. <laughs> but. I don't think you will. Oh, we've got a few more questions to go yet. So, um, what's next here? How about this one for you? What is a type SMA connector? A, a large bayonet connector usable at power levels in excess of one kilowatt. Useful and uh, okay. Up to one kilowatt, you say? I don't think so. Don't seem like a good idea. Don't seem like a good idea to me. 
B, a small threaded connector suitable for signals up to several gigahertz. C, a connector designed for serial multiple access signals. Or D, a type of push-on connector intended for high voltage applications. Well, see there are threads in it, and I wouldn't put a high voltage on that, so that's not going to be that. Of the potential answers we got there, it's small, it's threaded, and it is suitable for signals up to several gigahertz. I'm going to say that it is B along with uh, everybody else over in the chat room there. Mike did point out that it's made of faux gold, though. This one probably is, yeah. They, they could make them out of real faux gold, though, <laughs> or, or gold plating. But yeah, be a small threaded connector, suitable for signals up to several gigahertz. Cool. What is the maximum height above ground to which an antenna structure boy this is nothing about a connector is it nope what is the maximum height above ground to which an antenna structure may be erected without requiring notification to the faa and registration with the fcc provided it is not at or near a public use airport a 50 feet b 100 feet c 200 feet or d 300 feet. The maximum height above ground which antenna structure may be erected without requiring notification of the FAA and registration of the FCC. I know 50 feet's good. 100 feet, I'm sure, is good because some people have 100 foot towers. Yeah, you don't like to notify anybody. No, it's going to be C or D. 300 feet seem, uh, I'm, pretty, I'm sure 300 feet you would have to. 200 feet. That's pretty high too. I'm, I, I don't know the answer to this one, but I'm sure you do because of your line of work. But I'm, I'm guessing that it's going to be C, but... I'm not. I'm not sure. That's pretty Three, good guess. Three hundred feet. Three hundred feet's way up there. Yeah. So I know three hundred feet would be. Two hundred feet's pretty high too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You're correct. That was a good guess. It was a guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're going to need to know about it if you're going to put something two hundred feet or over. And they're going to make you like that when it gets up to 200 feet. That tower's oh, yeah. going to have to be lit. Yep. And depending on what kind of lighting you put on it, it, if you put strobe lighting, yeah, you can get probably get by with that. But after it's been registered, they will tell you though what they how they want you to light it. And if you just put red lights on it, you're going to have to stripe that thing alternate bands of white and aviation orange. Oh wow. Yeah. I haven't seen too many hams that had that type of setup. But, uh. No, nah, but there's quite a few of them that have a hundred foot. Oh, tower. yeah. Yeah. So that, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and now the, the rules used to be different. A lot of AM antennas back in the day, uh, AM broadcast stations had 200 foot antennas. And you might remember that every one of them was was striped with paint and had uh, red beacon lights and side lights on them at just 200 feet. They've changed the rules since then and gone up to, to 200. If you, you're uh, less than that, like, you're okay. Like some of that tower we tried to salvage? Right, yeah. yeah. I remember that stuff was painted yeah. red and white. I think those were, they may have been 300 foot. I don't remember how tall those were. But uh, anyway, 200 feet. You'll find apparel for all seasons, like they've got short sleeves for the summer. Now, they got long sleeves for the winter as well, and there's even lightweight jackets in there. And ball, ca ball caps. Ball caps. Uh, what else is there in there? A variety of different kinds of shirts. jackets, sweatshirts. Uh, yeah, I, need to, I really need to work on that thing, add some extra stuff. I, yep. think, I think the spreadshirts added some other things to uh, 
Yeah, some other products. Yeah. You can join us in two weeks here for the next Amateur Logic. We've got, uh, well, a lot of video that we shot at Field Day this year. We try to do it a little bit different than than previous years, just so we got something a little bit different. And it's and it's very different from what, as far as I know, pretty much everybody else does. I don't know anybody that goes completely off the grid like that. No. Now, and we were off of it, and the noise level was low. We, Oh, yeah, we were way off the grid. Yep. Like, way down a logging road. You'll see some video yep. of it. And, you know, I I noticed on social media after field day, a lot of people, almost everybody was complaining about how bad the bands were. They weren't that no, bad, we were had, they? It was pretty good for us. Yeah. Uh, we, we saw a lot of signals on there. There's no... Hmm. That, no dead bands except, well, 10 meters. Mm, never really saw much on there or six, but below that, uh, we had 15 meter, 20 meter, 40 meter. Mm -hmm. There was activity on 80. There just wasn't anybody doing field day on there for whatever reason. Yeah. yeah. It was, so it was a really good time. Join us for the next Amateur Logic and check all that stuff out. Yeah. Coming up uh, when? Uh, about two weeks from today. Around the 15th of July. So what if you wanted to catch up with us during the month? Where would you do that? Well, you could do it at the usual place, Facebook. We've got uh, Ham College and Amateur Logic groups there. Yeah. Uh, we're also on Twitter at Ham College and at Amateur Logic. Mm -hmm. And we're also in a new place We've uh, because uh, Google Plus is gone. So people ask for other uh, mm -hmm. means to, to get notified about show updates and things like that. So we created groups.io group, which you can see on the screen, groups.io slash G slash Amateur Logic. And there's been people joining up on that. So Yeah, it's been it's pretty popular. I kind of like it. It's, yeah. it's pretty cool. I was, was a little skeptical at first about it, but I think it's a good thing. Yeah. So... Um, yeah, welcome people who are joining uh, groups.io group. I, if I wasn't a Facebook guy, as a matter of fact, even if I even if I was a Facebook guy, I think I would sign up on that. If you s get the single emails, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of email on it, but if you get the single emails, you'll get the emails right before we go on the show. Yeah. Um, so if you, most people's email comes to their phone, and you'll get notified. So if you yeah. don't want to miss them, that's a good way. Yeah. And that's that's the big reason we did it, just to uh, have another way to notify folks, let them know what's coming up. Yeah, so go sign up. But there are some photos and stuff on there too. And uh, yeah, there's a little bit of yeah. chat, but yeah. it's not a lot. It's not enough that it's uh, you know that it's going to just mm -hmm. clog your inbox up and it's, it's a problem. But uh, there, it's good stuff. Yep. At least I think it is. I think that'll do it for uh, another class here. I hope that, well, we've got some graduates coming up here soon because we're almost to the end of the question pool. Oh, yeah. So we'll the, be hitting the extra coming up. Oh. Ooh, that's gonna that's be gonna tougher be tougher. One. Yeah, very much. We're gonna have to lubricate that buzzer good before we get to I those. I think we're gonna need a new buzzer. Yep, very well could. Well, thanks for being here tonight, everyone, and uh, thanks for watching, whether you watch live or you download. Uh, if you haven't taken that general exam yet, you need to be reviewing and getting ready, because yeah. it's, it's time. We've, yeah, and the question pool is going to be changing very quick, Yeah. so be, be aware of that and, and, uh, and, yep. and the new changes. There, there won't be a lot of changes, but there will be a few. There'll be a few, and we'll, we'll, we'll cover co those. Yeah, we will. Um, well, any final words before we go tonight, Dean? Nope, it's been fun, and I need to go put some more medicine on my chiggers. <laughs> <laughs> They're uh, itching. Okay. All right, well, join us again in the next month for the next Ham College, and uh, middle of the month for Amateur Logic. Well, 73, everybody. 73.
I told you we were going to shift gears when we came back. It looks like, is my microphone straight? Mostly. It hadn't shifted gears? It's okay. It's close okay. enough. All right. Well, let's see. We're can't unable get there to see. You can't, it's still, yeah. There is no correct answer. Of course, if I had the ICOM t-shirt there, I would be good to go as is. Or, you know, if I had a Hawaiian shirt, that will work for a lot of occasions, but sometimes you, you really need to look sharp. <laughs> and where can I get something if I was if one of those occasions were to arise? Where you really need to look sharp. <laughs> well, you might try amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com because I think there you'll find a pair. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs>